So let's pick up where we left off in the last video. So the year's 1901, about, and Max Planck has come up with an equation that solves the problem for what's the relationship between the intensity of emitted radiation and the wavelength and the temperature, right? So it's a complicated equation, but the important thing here is that to solve the problem, he said that energy has to be emitted or absorbed in quantized units, not a continuous value. It's got to be a specific value that's a multiple of Planck's constant times the frequency, right? So Planck doesn't like this idea. He thinks it's just a mathematical trick to make it work, and he's hoping he can do some more research and figure out what's actually going on. So in 1905, Albert Einstein is working as a patent clerk in a Swiss patent office, right? He's kind of in between jobs, and he's still writing scientific papers. And this year is sometimes referred to as his miracle year because he put out four papers in that one year. So he's probably most known for relativity. And he became like an overnight superstar when an astronomer named Arthur Eddington looked at an eclipse and Einstein's work predicted how a star would look differently when the sun was in the way, right? The light bent around the sun. And this observation proved that, right? He became a star overnight. But he actually won his Nobel Prize for his work on the photoelectric effect. And even the photoelectric effect was really controversial. He actually won the 1921 Nobel Prize in the year 1922 because they were so torn about whether to give it to him or not in 21 that they just said, I'm not going to give it to anybody. And they waited until 1922 and retroactively gave it to him. So what is the photoelectric effect? Basically, if you take a piece of metal, shine some light on it, it's going to cause electrons to be ejected. And you can hook it up to wires and you can create a circuit and it'll cause electricity to flow. Okay. So this was discovered in 1887 by Heinrich Hertz, the same guy they named the unit Hertz after. He was doing experiments with these spark gaps, and he was creating sparks to produce a big burst of electromagnetic radiation to study how those waves traveled, right? So he noticed that when he shined different lights or when he took the light away from the sparks, the sparks would change their behavior. He could make sparks easier or harder to produce depending on the type of light he shined. So he wrote up a whole paper about this, and he looked at studying like the different types of light and how far away the gaps were and everything. And then he promptly decided, oh, I'm not going to study this anymore, because he was only worried about his work in electromagnetic waves. So one of his students named Philip Lainard is the one who actually did most of the early work on the photoelectric effect and came up with the experiment that people would use to measure things. And so basically, this is what they did. You have a cathode and an anode, right? And so if you hook this up to an ammeter to measure the current, you can shine light on this cathode and what happens is electrons will jump off and that's going to create a current and you can measure that current with the ammeter. And so something they noticed was when they shined brighter light on the cathode, brighter light caused a bigger current. And that kind of makes sense because electrons, if you shine more light, you get more electrons, right? And electrons flowing is current, right? The number of electrons per unit time is current. So these electrons also have energy, right? And so to measure the energy, what they did was they said, okay, I'm going to take this and I'm going to stick in a battery right here. And they put the battery, it was a variable battery, but they made it to where this could push a current the other way. Okay, so this was called the stopping potential, right? It has a voltage and it was referred to as the stopping potential because what happens is you turn this battery up, you can make a bigger and bigger current to counteract this current from your cathode and eventually these two currents will cancel each other out and you will know that whatever the stopping potential here has to be equal to the maximum kinetic energy of the electrons that are being ejected from the cathode. So when they did experiments with this, they noticed that, yes, changing the intensity of the light changed the current. But when they came down here and looked at the stopping potential, that didn't really affect it. What affected the stopping potential was different colored light. So low frequency light, like yellow light, had a small stopping potential. And that means that those ejected electrons had a small energy. But high frequency light, like blue light, had a large stopping potential. And that means that those ejected electrons had a large energy. So there are a few unanswered questions with this. First off, if light is really a wave, then the intensity of the wave should determine the energy, right? Because according to Maxwell's equations, the energy of a wave is proportional to the amplitude, which is intensity. So if you shine more intense light, you should see a bigger stopping potential, but they weren't seeing that. Shining more intense light made no difference for the stopping potential, which is the energy of those electrons. And the other thing they noticed was when you did this, if light was really a wave, 
this should take time for those electrons to be ejected because their thinking at the time was that it was absorbing the energy from the wave and so that electron would have to vibrate more and more and more and it would take time for it to be ejected. But what happened was when they shined the light, this happened instantaneously. It took off right away. So the best hypothesis at the time was called the triggering hypothesis put forth by Leonard. And basically it said that the light, all it was doing was triggering the electron to jump. The electron already had the energy inherent in it just from being in the atom. And that light just came in and it kind of gave it a push and triggered it to jump, kind of like setting off a mousetrap, right? And so his explanation for the frequency mattering was he said that this light has a frequency and that it matched the frequency of that electron in the atom. And so only these certain frequency waves would come in and they had to match up with a specific electron and that would free that electron. And so that's how they explained it for a long time. So Einstein's approach to solving this problem was different. Einstein took what's called a heuristic approach. And a heuristic approach is basically where you're going to use a method, and that method is unproven, but you're going to hope that it works. And if it does work, you'll go back and fix it later. You're just using it as a method to get to the solution. So Einstein took Planck's idea and took the next, what seemed to him, logical step. So he basically said, Light consists of a finite number of energy quanta localized at points in space and moving without dividing and can only be produced and absorbed as complete units, which is what we call today photons, right? He's describing a photon. So here's Einstein's model, and it's really simple and elegant. And it makes a lot of sense now, but back in the day, this was not something that people were ready to accept. So here's this photon that's going to come in and it's going to strike this electron, and the electron's going to jump off, and it's going to have some maximum kinetic energy, right? So this photon comes in. It has an energy equal to Planck's constant times the frequency, and that electron absorbs the photon, takes all the energy, and it's ejected with some maximum kinetic energy, right? But this electron is bound to this atom, so it's going to take work to actually free the electron from the atom. So Einstein's equation says the maximum kinetic energy of the ejected electron is going to equal the energy you put in from the photon minus the work you have to do to free it. And that's called the work function, the Greek letter phi, right? And every metal has its own work function because all atoms are different, right? And it takes different amount of energy to free different things. But this equation is basically just conservation of energy. Your electron comes out with an energy equal to what you put in minus the work that you had to pay to get the electron to come out. So initially when Einstein's theory came out, it was not accepted at all because this went against Maxwell's equations. And at the time, Maxwell's equations, they had unified everything and it showed that electromagnetic waves all behaved the same way, right? And this went against that. This was saying that light wasn't really waves. Even Planck, whose work Einstein built on, didn't like this idea. Planck proposed his own theory that was basically Lennard's triggering hypothesis, but just a kind of a quantum version of it. But it was still triggering, right? Planck didn't want to accept this. To show you kind of how much he didn't like it, look at a letter that Planck wrote to the Prussian Academy of Sciences in 1913, kind of as a recommendation letter to get Einstein admitted. It wasn't until 1914 when Robert Millikan did an experiment that verified this equation to work that it became more accepted. And even then, Millikan said he was only verifying the equation, not the idea of light quanta. So here's some cuts from Millikan's paper. You can see he said that quantum theory is only supposed to be an aid to interpreting the absorption and emission of radiation. He called Einstein's theory bold and reckless. He said he only made it because it furnished an explanation to the strange result of energy of ejected electrons depending on frequency of light and not in the intensity as Maxwell's laws had said. And at the end, he says that Planck's quantum triggering hypothesis works just as well as Einstein's theory. And he hopes that someone's going to come along and find a way to solve this without using light quanta. There's even another sentence in here where he recognizes Einstein's validity, but he questions the underlying hypothesis, saying he doubts that even Einstein believes it. So triggering that hypothesis eventually died and people kind of accepted Einstein's hypothesis because the main problem with triggering was that if you say that this is only triggering the electron to jump and the electron already has the energy, then if you heat this cathode up, that electron's going to have more energy, right? Because it's hotter and the electron's moving around more. So you should be able to heat the cathode up, shine light, and see bigger stopping potential, which means kinetic energy. But they weren't seeing that. You could heat this cathode up, and that didn't change the energy of those ejected electrons. So by 1914, triggering's gone. People have started to really kind of accept Einstein's uh, equation, but it wasn't until like the early 20s where the theory itself 
they kind of realized that, okay, this is probably the way things are happening. So this idea took 15 years for people to kind of accept. And while this was going on, the next thing we're going to look at is the model of the atom, because the original model of the atom was nothing like the way atoms really work. And there was another big fight over how the atom looked on the inside and how it behaved. And that involves Niels Bohr and his model of the atom.